All right, welcome to the first of my videos on the A-level physics required practicals. The first one a lot of people will do is the investigation into how the frequency of the first harmonic on a piece of string varies with tension, length, or mu, that's mass per unit length, but that's a bit of a mouthful, so I just say also known as stationary waves on string. Obviously, you're gonna to have to do this as a required practical, but also it could come up in an exam question, so it's really important that you understand everything that's going on. Okay, so let's remind ourselves about the equation for the frequency of the first harmonic. Frequency is equal to one over two L times the square root of tension over mu. So L is the length of the piece of string, T is the tension that is the force pulling on the end of the piece of string. Mu, if you remember, is mass per unit length. So that's kilograms per meter of the string. Okay, so generally what we wanna do with these experiments is change one of these things in here that's our independent variable. We want to measure another, that's our dependent, and I want to keep the rest constant, that's our controls. And then finally, they want to draw a graph, that's gonna be a straight line, graph has to be get gradient. And then finally, we wanna calculate something from the gradient and compare with real value. So there's quite a few variables in this equation. That's why it's a fairly tricky one to start off with. But obviously frequency is going to be our dependent. We want to see how the frequency changes. That's always going to be true. But we could change one of these three things, any of them. We could change the length, and then we could find out what the frequency is, or the tension, or the mass per unit length. So that's up to you. The best thing to do is to change the tension in the string, though. But of course, you might get a question where L or mu are changed instead. Anyway, let's go with T for now. So I want to keep the rest constant, so that means mu and L. And that's very important that you put down your controls, that you say, I'm keeping length of the string the same, mu the same as well. It's the same piece of string, so it should be fine. We're going to draw a straight line graph. Uh, we can see that F is not proportional to T. So we can't put F against T. That does not give us a straight line. But if we square the whole thing, we end up with F squared over here, just T over here. So we can say that F squared is proportional to T. So we can have F squared up there. We should get a straight line. and We can find the gradient of that. Calculate something from the gradient and compare with true value. We're going to do this for mu. OK, so let's actually go through the steps, shall we? All right, so here's what we have. We have our table with our piece of string going from a vibration generator over the pulley and going over the table with some slotted masses hanging on the end. We only say 200 grams max because otherwise the vibration generator might break. We don't want loads and loads of tension. We've got a signal generator here that is driving the vibration generator. That's also then hooked into the cathode ray oscilloscope or CRO. That allows us to see the waveform that is being put into the vibration generator. That's how we're going to find our frequency. So what we want to do is start with maybe, I don't know, 40 grams, something like that on the string. We want to change frequency of generator until the first harmonic appears on the string. What does the first harmonic look like? Well, it's just one big loop. It's when the string is going like that. So you have a really big amplitude in the middle and no amplitude at the ends. We know that's always going to be the case for the first harmonic. Now, if you were answering this as a question, I'd just go for first harmonic. I personally go for the second harmonic instead. We could say that it's easier to see the node in the middle there, or we can say the node in the center is better defined than the antinode of the first harmonic. There's a range of frequencies that the first harmonic might appear over, but if we go for the second harmonic, that node in the middle is either there or it isn't. But that's personal preference. But like I said, if this was an exam question, then I would just go with the first harmonic. What do we then do? We obtain the time period from CRO. And so you'll see lots of waves on your CRO, but we are looking for that in between one peak to the next or one midpoint to the next. It doesn't matter, it's gonna be the same. Now, using a CRO, it's a good idea to make sure that only one or two waves appear on the screen. Because we've got little lines on the CRO that give us our time base, that means that it's more precise if we have our wave covering more of those. Very important. What do we do with that then? Calculate frequency by F equals one over T. 
Frequency is one over the time period. Now, just be aware that when you do have your CRO, uh, the scale can be shifted using something called a time base. So you just need to be aware of that. So it'll tell you how many milliseconds each big square on the screen is. You just need to multiply by that. How do we get the tension? Well, tension is equal to mg because it's the same as the weight pulling down here. That's your weight and that's also equal to the tension in the string. Obviously the mass needs to be in kilograms. We're then going to plot F squared against the tension. Now just be aware we have capital T's all over the shop here. This is frequency equals one over time period. Tell you what, I'll put time period in blue there. Whereas this is our tension. So if we have a graph of F squared against T, we should get a straight line because they are proportional. We calculate the gradient. Let's have a look at our equation again. F equals one over two L root T over mu. So if we square the whole thing, we end up with F squared equals one over four L squared times T over mu. So whenever we have a graph and we're finding the gradient, the gradient is equal to Y divided by X. So that is F squared divided by T. So if I rearrange this to find that, then we end up with F squared over T. And so this now is equal to the gradient. The gradient is equal to one over four L squared mu. Of course, if you did the second harmonic, all you have to do is half the frequency before you plot them on the graph. Let's say that we want to find mu from this. Let's say that's what we're verifying. Let me just write that out nice and neatly again. So gradient equals one over four L squared mu. All you have to do is swap gradient and mu over. Therefore, mu is equal to one divided by four L squared times the gradient. So we can calculate mu from the gradient, provided we have our length of string. Obviously, we measure that with a ruler. Very important that you put down what you're measuring everything with. And then we can compare with actual mu. How do we obtain the actual mu? We obtain it by placing the string on, well, let's say a 0.01 gram balance. Mu is equal to the mass obtained in kilograms divided by the length of the string that you put on the balance. It might not be the length from here to here. It might be the whole string you're putting on. So you just need to be aware that it could be a different length. Now there is going to be a source of uncertainty. There's not going to be much uncertainty in the length because it's long and the resolution of the ruler is one millimeter. And so we can forget about that. Tension, no, because we're going to assume that the masses are correct. There is an uncertainty in the time period that we measure with the CRO though. So what we do is calculate percentage uncertainty in the time period. And because we calculate frequency from that, that is equal to the percentage uncertainty in the frequency. But because we need to go to percentage uncertainty in F squared, if we're going to plot error bars, because we're squaring with times in, we need to double the percentage uncertainty in frequency to find the percentage uncertainty in F squared. What do we then do? Turn back into absolute uncertainty in F squared, and we can plot error bars. And then you probably know that once we've got error bars on here, we're then gonna do a line of worst fit. We could do two lines of worst fit. You don't necessarily have to do a line of best fit and then take an average. I prefer to do a line of best fit and then do a line of worst fit. Percentage uncertainty in gradient is equal to line of worst fit, take away line of best fit gradients, divided by the line of best fit. Obviously then we times by 100 as well. That is equal to the percentage uncertainty in mu. So let's just make up some numbers, shall we? Let's say that one of your time periods is 10 milliseconds, but the resolution of the CRO is one millisecond. That's the smallest thing that the CRO can measure. So 10, one, so that means we have a 10% uncertainty in the time period. We also have a 10% uncertainty in frequency. That means we have a 20% uncertainty in frequency squared. Then we just take our reading for F squared and then times that by 20% of 0.2. And then that gives us our error bars. And then let's say that maybe once you've done your line of best fit, etc., we find that we have an uncertainty of 25% in your gradient. That means that whatever number you calculate for mu, there's gonna be a 25% uncertainty in that. 
So I hope that helps. If there's anything that you think I've missed or anything you think that you'd like me to do different for the rest of the required practice, then put it in the comment down below. I'd really appreciate your feedback. And if you want to see me doing this in real life, then you can click on the card and it'll take you to the video that I made for Marsbury Science. And I'll see you all next time.